This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. This show is brought to you by IndieWrestling.us. Check out IWC, RWA, and more. And listeners like you, support this show at Patreon.com slash Wrestling Mayhem Show. Hey guys, it's the Indie Mayhem Show. I'm Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on the Twitter here in the Sorgatron Media Studio in Pittsburgh, PA. And this is a show we talk with people in and around independent professional wrestling. And you can check everything out at WrestlingMayhemShow.com. This and other fantastic podcasts around professional wrestling. As well as IndieWrestling.us. You can drop us a line at GoodTimes at WrestlingMayhemShow.com or 412-206-WMS0. If you have any questions for any of our announced guests... Uh, or if you have any suggestions on people we should talk to uh, on the show. I mean, we can't watch all the indie wrestling out there. Hell, I can't even watch all the network shows at this point. I'm so sorry, 205 Live. Uh, But uh, anyways, this week we have a returning guest and a longtime old friend of the show. DJ Z is back with us. Ba, 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 ba. Thank you. I was so I was so upset. I did not, you know, Mad Mike is working. I couldn't get him on during the show to, because still, every time on the show, he has to get that in when we bring up your name. It's over. People love the air horn. They love the air horn and they love the lights. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The the um yeah definitely the most visuals these days. I I I've been having a lot of fun. You know when people see see the video of you, I'm like, you know, I remember one time, uh, probably about a year ago, when um it was probably like a suit or so ago where I saw you light up in the old IWC set, and I thought a motorcycle was going to come through the entrance. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it's very bright, very bright. Uh, like the first time I wore it, I didn't even realize it, but it's great was they have all the lights out at IWC. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's when you get the full effect. You need to have a blackout entrance for me. Uh, there's some places that for whatever <laughs> reason don't do the blackout entrance, even though they have the capability to do so. Yeah. And they're really shooting themselves in the foot. Listen, I've been at venues where if the lights go out, you have to wait 10 minutes to turn them on. I mean... Not even like the halogens, like to switch them on again or they're going to explode. Yeah, now that is a problem for sure. But <laughs> worth it, worth it. Definitely worth it. I mean, that should be a rider in your, in your, uh, you're like, <laughs> listen, man, if you want the most of DJZ, these are the conditions for maximum DJ. Yeah, potential. We, we need the lights out. We need somebody who's competent enough to run the air horn because mm-hmm. that gets screwed up nearly every other weekend. No matter how many times I explain it to the sound guy. Well, for those that maybe haven't seen you like recent since you, you started doing that or, or caught, caught you out there, because um, I can't remember how did, was did the air horn being done a lot on, on Impact. Well, it was something that I did for the Bromans during their tag team right, matches. Right. I would trigger the horn after they would hit a maneuver, mm-hmm. a double team, whatever, and we kind of phased it out. And as I moved on with my career as a singles wrestler, a more serious singles wrestler. Mm-hmm. I wasn't using it so much, and I thought that there was still an opportunity to incorporate it. So I just tried it out a few times, having the sound guys on independent shows trigger the horn after I would do an offensive maneuver. And yeah, it's been a lot of trial and error, but now it's become a part of my act, and it's something that people look forward to every single match now. And when I'm going to hit the horn, you know. And hopefully, like, there's a, a sound guy that like kind of knows it's coming, right? Well, that's the problem. Is like it's screwed up every other weekend, no matter how many <laughs> times I explain to the sound guy. Listen, all you have to do is load the sample, have it ready to go, have your finger on the trigger. I only trigger it in the beginning of the matches. Mm -hmm. So as long as you are ready, when I call for that horn, you hit the button. That's it. And you'd be amazed at how difficult that seems to be. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Uh, So, uh, you know, I I know we've we've talked a little bit on Facebook about your your, your light uh, uh, suits and everything, too. Um, you know, has that been, cause I, I don't know too many indie guys that, that come with as much gear, Yeah, you know, entrance wise. Like, I mean, I mean, we've seen people with the, the, the robes and the suits and everything and they got to take off half, you know, take half of the, an entrance to take everything off. But like you have like, that's gotta be a bitch to travel with. Yeah, it, it is a hassle. The, the predator suit in particular mm-hmm. that I was wearing, that one is very difficult because it doesn't fold up. So I have to like carry it on a hanger as if it's like a suit and then carry that on to all of my flights. And if the planes don't have like a little coat rack for me to hang it on, Mm -hmm. well, then what do you do? Then I have to like shove it into the overhead bin. And again, it does not fold. Mm -hmm. So it's a real hassle. And that's probably why the suit 
eventually stopped working and I've had to send it twice now for repairs just because shoving it into these overhead bins, I'm sure that's doing some damage to the bulbs and the lights. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then we end up with suit malfunctions. Well, it's a, it's definitely a fun dedication to, to that. And, and I know a lot of people look forward to it. Um, so since we've had you on, a lot has happened. A good, a good bit has oh, happened, yeah. good and bad. I'm always up to something, good or bad, yeah. <laughs> I think when we first talked to you, you were first starting the um, the uh, your video series about missing flights most of the time. Yeah, that didn't last long. No, no. <laughs> um, and I know I've heard some some stories about, uh, um, I think it was when you were going to, to Japan or something, too. Uh, well, you got the wrong day. Oh, that was out. like 10 years ago. <laughs> but you know, you'd be amazed. You'd think after making mistakes like that in my early days in wrestling, I'd learn from those mistakes and we'd grow out of that stuff. No, it still happens. Like no. these, these things still happen to this day. It doesn't matter how many times I make the mistake, how old I get, how much time has passed. Mm -hmm. I will still confuse dates and miss flights and screw up travel. Like it never changes. And it amazes me. It truly amazes me that I just can't get it together. I will have you know, as somebody that's doing a lot of business travel these days, I, I take you as a cautionary tale. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that's what, like, I'm not like glorifying these uh, misadventures or anything like that. If anything, I share these stories. One, of course, to make people laugh, but mm -hmm. more so to let people know, hey, don't make these mistakes. Like, learn from me, please. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, of course, uh, Mexico City, I think everybody's heard the story. Um, yeah. uh, you've had some issues there. And, and still, unbelievably, you were wrestling just like months later. Yeah, it, it was uh, probably the dumbest thing I've ever done. <laughs> I, I, uh, I returned at Super Indy in yep. the beginning of June 2017. I wasn't medically cleared until the end of August 2017. So like a couple months that I should not have been in the ring, but I was in the ring pretty much every weekend uh, despite uh, a crazy injury to my stomach that was not fully healed and I mm -hmm. could have made 10 times worse because of my wrestling and the way that I wrestle. Of course, uh, there was a lot of mental health issues going on during that time as well. Like I should not have been in a ring at all, but that's the hard part. When you make your living legitimately as a professional wrestler, you can't take the time off. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what I was going to do. Now looking back on it, I probably should have just tried to get a job, but I'm stubborn and I've never had a regular job before. Mm -hmm. Pro wrestling is my only job. So it causes me a little bit of anxiety to think like, okay, now we have to go get a normal job. I know like, yeah, that's the responsible thing to do. But when you've never done it before, yeah, it's kind of nerve wracking to like imagine yourself doing it. So you've been well, probably about 10 years. You've been solely wrestling, right? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much 10 or 11. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I mean, you know, of course, you know, involved with impact wrestling and everything over the years too, uh, and traveling the world. Um, so, and, and I'm watching that, that super indie match. I think we were, we were, uh, we were live filming it. Yeah. And, uh, I, I know, uh, every time there was like a gut shot, like, it was just like, like uh, us as the audience just wins. It was like, Oh, don't, don't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was doing ridiculous things. I remember I dove over the guardrail in that match and this yeah. was all eight weeks after it all happened. Eight weeks is like nothing, mm -hmm. you know? And for me to be taking risks like that while my stomach, uh, my, my abdomen had been cut open just eight weeks prior. I don't know what was going through my mind, but you know, I don't, I don't know what's going through my mind half the time. I just do things and it always seems to work out. <laughs> there might be a lot of uh, trial and error, a lot of misfortune in between, but in the end, it always seems to work out. <laughs> mm -hmm. and I think I've seen you've been the Ma back to Mexico since I think you were just there a few weeks ago, right? I was just, the, I just got back yesterday. Oh, Mexico. yesterday. <laughs> I go all the time. <laughs> That's great. Um, I, I wanted to talk about a little bit of. Uh, I had the fortune to film a training session with you. Yeah. Um, up in Cleveland, um, with uh, I think it was around the welterweight wrestling mm -hmm. uh, show. Uh, and you're you're teaching lucha libre, and, and I know we talked about in the past, like kind of you doing that training, um, and still going at it and everything too. Um, tell me tell me a little bit about um what's what it's like to be on kind of the training side of you know teaching this kind of different style. It, it was really cool to watch, like. You know, you're kind of adapting like, hey, you're taught this here, but, you know, in Mexico, they do it this way, you know. Yeah, I think it's really rewarding for me to be involved with training the next generation of wrestlers, help them out any way that I can, especially with something like Lucha Libre. When I started out, 
there was nobody around Pittsburgh or really around the United States at the time that could teach you the proper technique of Lucha Libre. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to learn that, you had to go to Mexico. That was the only way. People watch tapes and think they understand how to do something, but I feel like if you watch a lot of independent wrestling, when guys try Lucha Libre maneuvers and don't have the proper technique, it never quite looks as good as it does when the luchadors in Mexico do it. Right. It, it seemed like I was getting the impression that there's this this kind of different flow to things and like smoothness that when yeah. you do it right. Yeah. There, there's just a lot of uh, uh, technique involved. And if you don't know the proper technique, it's never going to come off as clean or as smooth. And to have somebody teach me the proper technique when I was starting out, I would have killed for that. Mm -hmm. So I'm in this position now where – I've been to Mexico several times. I've trained with some of the best wrestlers down there. And I can come back now and teach proper Lucha Libre technique to the next generation of wrestlers up here. And I think that's great. You know, it's great to be able to do that to help people out. I wish I had that. And uh, I'm more than happy to do it. And it's the most rewarding feeling to teach these guys how to like run up the ropes where maybe they don't have the confidence to do it or they don't believe that they're capable of doing it. But once I teach them the proper technique and they do it just to see how excited they get to see their faces light up and it just builds their confidence. You know, mm -hmm. that's the best feeling in the world. I, I'm watching that watching this. I felt like I could run up the ropes after seeing all you that. You could for sure. <laughs> and I, I like am you not. If you're just watching yeah. an audio, I am not the most uh, physical uh, pro person here. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'm so proud of. I've done a countless number of these seminars now. Mm -hmm. I've had near 300 pound guys run up the ropes. I personally have based 250 pound guys for tilt to whirl maneuvers. It's all technique. And that's the thing I'm trying to like teach them is you're capable. Like I don't want to hear about you're too big or you've never done that before. Trust me. Like you are capable. Mm -hmm. You just have to believe it and you just have to pay attention to the technique. That's it. I mean, we're, we're seeing guys like Kevin Owens doing, you know, maybe not a Lucha, but like moves like these right there. Just like, don't like not what you expect right yeah and that's what i'm saying it's like just because you're 250 pounds doesn't mean you're not capable of you see guys like kevin owens can mm -hmm. do it and there's so many big guys that are so agile now it's like no that's not an excuse you know you can do it for mm -hmm. sure <laughs> i was watching a, a ward though who's as tall as me and and jack doing swanton bombs like nothing is is just ridiculous oh he's just a freak out <laughs> he so, kind right? of is <laughs> he kind of is he's kind of rolling with that superman moniker these yep. days um so at the beginning of the year uh the big news coming for you and i, I know this, this made the rounds you you were announced as a free agent yeah uh, no longer under contract with impact wrestling i know you had a pretty big year with impact wrestling with the tag team championships and everything um so tell me a little bit about that transition i mean this is a company you've been uh, uh, with for a while uh, through the ups and downs and everything, and I and in disclosure, I've been working a little bit on their live feeds as well. They're definitely a far different company than they were probably when you were first signed. Oh yeah, I've seen so many changes. I feel like it's been a different company about four or five different times <laughs> in all the years that I was there. But uh, 2018, I gave it one last run. I was actually considering the free agency at the end of 2017, mm -hmm. but. They had convinced me to try it out for one more year with Impact 2018. And they booked me about three times, I think. So to be booked three times over the course of an entire year, I just didn't see a reason to stay there. Clearly, mm -hmm. they were in a different direction. They didn't have plans for me. And of course, we see that over like the course of maybe three months of tapings, probably, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I believe so. But... Uh, I wasn't booked much by them, and there was really no discussion on me re-signing with them. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really interested in re-signing since I had been barely booked. So I thought, well, this just feels right. And I think I was coming up on seven years under contract with Impact, so maybe it was that seven-year itch. I don't know. <laughs> but it felt like the right time. Like, truly, it felt like the right time. Mm -hmm. Maybe I had considered it in the past, but it was always like, I want to be a free agent, but I also kind of want to stay with impact. So mm -hmm. I was never like 100% either way, but this was the first time that I felt 100% for sure. I want to be a free agent. And uh, when I announced the free agency, at the beginning of the year, I was really taken back by the response that it got online and how uh, supportive people were and how excited people were about what's next. And uh yeah, 
just trust me when I say that, uh, yeah, big things are ahead. The free agency thing is uh, my situation now, but I don't know that it will always be mm -hmm. that way. So stay tuned. It's definitely a heck of a time, you know, of course, with the independents or other companies rising up. Um, no pun for our rise friends of either spelling. Uh, <laughs> so Yeah, we got to do something about yeah, that. Yeah, we got to do it. It's like the, the mode on the show is like rise with a Y, rise with an I, yeah. you know. Listen, as an advertising major... <laughs> It's called brand confusion. Yes, a little bit, a little bit, especially when I'm like the guys like, oh, they're going to be a rise. Like, well, that's confusing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, where was it going with that? Oh, indie wrestling. Hottest thing. You know, probably the hottest has ever been for a while. So there's a lot of opportunity even oh, as yeah. a free agent. Yeah, absolutely. It's an exciting time. I'm so thankful that I'm healthy and able to be a part of the wrestling industry mm -hmm. at, at this crazy time that we're in. There's more opportunity than ever for guys to have jobs in wrestling. For the longest time, it was just WWE or Impact, at least to me. And then, of course, there's like Ring of Honor, uh, New Japan. But now there's several other options. You know, there's All Elite, there's MLW, there's this, there's that. It's so exciting, and it's great for the guys. You know, and, and the world changes too. Because I mean, I think I think you know, ten years ago when we actually literally ten years ago, I think we had our first interview here. Yeah, like it was a different world where you know you wouldn't know where you'd fit in with like a WWE, but there's so many options now. Yeah. And that's the best part about it. Like there's so many opportunities to win now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's great for the guys and girls involved in wrestling. And yeah, I just need to stay healthy so I can take advantage of these opportunities. <laughs> no more, no more crazy maneuvers in Mexico city. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the thing is like, I, I keep thinking that I'm, uh, past doing all these crazy maneuvers. Like I don't need to do it anymore. I've proven myself. I've earned my stripes, mm -hmm. but there's just still this little psychopath inside my head that wants to do crazy stuff, even though I know it's not necessary or maybe it's not the right show. I could save my body for the next big opportunity, but I don't know. Sometimes I just still want to ball out and it happens. And that's probably why I'm always banged up and sore, but yeah, I like wrestling like a, crazy ass and i will continue to do so i'm gonna do so tonight <laughs> yeah that's right as of this recording uh we're heading down you're gonna be in pittsburgh which man i don't know last time you wrestled in the city of pittsburgh that probably wasn't for a taping for somebody or something or yeah, even that I mean, I mean, i'm just thinking your history in general here yeah i, I mean obviously we wrestled in elizabeth and all these yeah, outskirts yeah. but but not like, like in the on city south side <laughs> no i couldn't i don't know that i ever have this yeah. might be a first on Carson Street, which is the street that gets, uh, for those out there, that gets called out that Elias, uh, I, th I think uh, Graves has called out that he doesn't see Elias on uh, on East Carson Street in Pittsburgh uh, <laughs> on the show uh, when he first debuted out there. So Maybe uh, Lawrenceville. Or maybe something. Lawrenceville. He definitely looks like a Lawrenceville guy, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but no, a lot of cool things going on there. Um, I know, you know, uh, let's talk a little bit about your home place because I know it has recently been announced that you will be having your last match with IWC here coming up next yeah, week. Yeah, March 16th. For the anniversary show, I believe it's uh, 18 is the name of the show. Yeah. Very literal anniversary shows these days for IWC. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing that IWC has been around 18 years for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, I started thinking about how long I've been around IWC uh 14 years so almost the entire run which is very exciting uh makes me feel old uh but hats off to guys like chuck roberts and then justin Plummer that have kept it going all these years it's a great place for the up-and-coming wrestlers the next generation of stars to hone their craft it's great for pittsburgh like without iwc like man I, I just don't know what the scene would look like in Pittsburgh. So it's a staple and 18 years. It's uh, awesome to be a part of the anniversary show one last time mm -hmm. and to wrestle my friends, all the guys that I trained with at IWC when we were teenagers, Jimmy DeMarco, Facade, Jason Gorey, all of us sharing a ring one more time. What better way to go out? That, you know what I'm saying? For me, as you know, obviously I do the production there, but I mean, I started as a fan of IWC, and to yeah. me, that was like the golden era of the tag team wrestling, of the super indie, was seeing you guys go at it and, and develop, even back to, to the team catfish days. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, what I'm proud of is that crop of guys, that generation of rookies or trainees from IWC. We really changed the game as far as uh, the way – IWC shows were presented mm -hmm. before our class. IWC was a place that brought in outside stars. Mm -hmm. And that was the draw. You came to see the outside guys from impact or from ring of honor or from the independence. 
the local guys, yeah, they were a part of the show, but they were not the focal point. They were not what people were coming to see. It wasn't until guys like myself, Jason Gorey, the Gambinos, Jimmy DeMarco, Facade. It wasn't until our classes, in my opinion, that everything kind of shifted. And then people started going to IWC for the locals to see these crazy tag team matches that we were all having, the athleticism that we, we were doing, the crazy risk that we were taking every show. We really changed the whole way that Norm Connors at the time presented the shows. Mm -hmm. And he started building his shows around his great local talent as opposed to the outside guys. And then mixing the two, the outside guys would come in to wrestle us and mm -hmm. that would help us get better. And then if we get better, then the shows are better. You know, like I just am really proud of the fact that I think we changed wrestling in Pittsburgh and in IWC in that way. So it'll be really awesome to get in there with those guys one more time on and, March 16th. And it seems it's still continue trying to build that core and, you know, just, you know, great names coming out there doing a lot of cool things like yourself, Elias, Facade, Agori, uh, Brett Baker, you mm -hmm. know, obviously just signing with AEW. Yep. Um, you, we had, uh, your opponent who debuted against you, uh, on the show, uh, Johnny patch oh, right, from right. a few months ago, um, which had been the most incredible, uh, proving grounds is the, the debut show for a lot of these guys in the yeah. classes. Um, but th to have that as a first match, you know, <laughs> between him against you, um, you know, another guy against Dylan Bossick, like kind of, you know, veterans in the ring here, um, instead of just the trainees going at it, like, you know, that, that really kind of stuck out. Yeah, I think you can have the trainees wrestle each other, and mm -hmm. that's cool, but in some ways it's the blind leading the blind because they're all inexperienced, especially in their a lot of their first matches at Proving Ground. I don't know how that would go. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot better to have a vet in the ring with these guys holding their hand for their first matches and guiding them through the process. And I was happy to do that with Johnny Patch. The guy's got a lot of athleticism, uh, a bright future in wrestling, obviously, and I let him know, like, hey, man, not that I think I'm anything special, but facts are facts. I've been wrestling for a living for 10 years now. I've traveled the world. I definitely consider myself as one of the top independent wrestlers in the country slash in the world, whatever. So for you to come in in your first match, step in the ring with me, hang with me, and do a great job, like, that says a lot. So the guy's got a great, bright future ahead of him. And... uh yeah, he's somebody to keep an eye on for sure. Definitely. Good class there uh, this year. Um, you know, a lot of cool stuff going on there. So um, so what's next? What's coming up for you? Anything else? Of course, you know, I mentioned IWC WrestleRex here tonight, which by the time you guys hear this, it'll be uh, probably out in VOD by then. Um, but anything anything big? A any Anything you want to check off your list in indie wrestling in your free agency? Not really, man. I've kind of done it all at this point. Like... Every cool thing that you can do as an independent wrestler, I feel like I've done it. Like, I went to Japan and I wrestled at Cork and Hall. Like, okay, of course every guy wants to do that. I wrestled at Arena Mexico in Mexico City. I've trained with all the luchadors that I grew up watching and idolized. Uh, wrestled at PWG, wrestled at Ring of Honor, Evolve, AAW, like whatever the top independents are. I've got to do that, too. Uh, got to go to all kinds of weird countries like Russia and Singapore and wrestle their top wrestlers. Mm -hmm. It's like really like what more can you do at this point? And uh, yeah, I think the only thing left off the bucket list now is I just want to wrestle all my friends like one last time. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got the match at IWC, but I'm going to wrestle with Sammy Guevara, who's somebody I kind of like mentored early on in his career. Uh, Pat Monix, who's a guy in Chicago that's uh Definitely got a bright future. I'm going to wrestle him one more time. I'm going to wrestle Gringo Loco, who's uh, a guy that I also like kind of like guided and directed a little bit, and he's doing great things. And we had a good rivalry. Uh, tonight, I get to wrestle Phoenix and Pentagon one more time. So mm. I'm just like really happy to get to share the ring with like all my friends and people that uh, have been a big part of my career, a big part of my journey. And we're all just going to have some fun. That's what this is all about at the end of the day. Like That's wrestling's awesome. about having fun and. I'm having a blast, and I'm only just getting started. If you think things are fun now, stay tuned because it's about to get even more fun than you could ever imagine. That's awesome. I, I, I just remembered that you had a match recently against the other shiny person in wrestling, Mustafa uh, Ali at Evolve, yep. just a little bit ago. Yeah, that was exciting as well. Uh, Mustafa Ali and I both trained together in the Lucha Libre gyms in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So he's somebody that has also been around me for years uh, and super indie nine. I think he popped in. Yep. That was because of me. I was the guy that recommended him 
that's my phone going off. We can silence that, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> no, don't worry. We'll fix it in post. Okay. I don't know how, but you can try. Uh, so, yeah. And then Mustafa Ali comes out with a, a similar type of costume to mine. And obviously, the comparisons are there. The fact that we're friends and trained together, like people started scratching their heads, wondering if uh, that was an idea that maybe was borrowed from me. Who knows? But it was really cool to get in the ring with him and have this moment where the dueling light up suits were in the same ring at the same time. And we did a face off with all the lights going off. It was pretty crazy. And for me, it was like a feather in my cap because I was like, I'm standing next to you right now. You might be on WWE, but I know my lights are better (laughs) and I'm standing side by side to prove it. So it was really cool. And I wrestled that match. Like my life depended on it just because I imagined okay, we're a week before Survivor Series. Ali is wrestling Buddy Murphy on the Mm pay-per-view. Surely somebody at WWE is going to be watching this match. So let's wrestle like it's a job interview or something. And yeah, I just put my heart and soul into that match. And it was great. Definitely like one of the favorite memories and best matches of my career so far. So check that out over at WWNlive.com if you haven't seen it already. There you go. That's awesome. Hey, it's been great. Uh, I, you know, Mara, what's next for you? I, I always remember you, you as the guy that did Baby Batista uh, over by my laundry in the basement in the old studio that we used to do the show in. Yeah. So. <laughs> I might have one more left in me. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you just got to do that. Like, do, do that with Batista if you get the opportunity oh, someday. The Big Dave? <laughs> Man, check that off the bucket list. Uh, that, that's what's left. That's the answer to the question. I want to do the Batista entrance with Batista. <laughs> you need to write the list like when Cody left of like yeah. the things you want to do. My, my list like, would be pretty ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, do the pose with Batista on there. Also, you know, do some Drax bits too. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Hey, he's, he's back around doing stuff in wrestling. So who knows? Um, anyways, thank you so much. Uh, where can people find out what's going on with you? I am DJ Z on all social media. I had like all these different, social media oh, handles for the longest thank time you so much for narrowing those down uh, dude listen uh, more pro tips for the uh next generation of independent wrestlers just make all of your social media handles or whatever you call them just have them all be the same thing so much easier to find yourself uh, or so much easier for people to find you rather if it's just simple like mine's i am djz on instagram on twitter on youtube it's all i am djz please Help people out. Help yourself out. Make it easier to find help yourself. People. Help people. Yeah. Help people find you. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I am DJ Z. All social media. Awesome. Go check it out. And if you want to check out some DJ Z under various names, uh, <laughs> <laughs> some that you maybe were tough to spell over the years. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, you can you can for sure find some old Shima Zion and Zima Ion matches over here at a Sorgatron Media. But uh, yeah, definitely watch the DJZ stuff first because it's the best. I can't even watch my old stuff anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks so much for joining us here. And again, go check it out. We, I know we have some stuff over at IndieWrestling.us, IndieWrestling.network, including that IWC show. We'll be coming up there as soon as it is ready uh, there in late March. So until next time, thank you so much. Uh, support Indie Wrestling and uh, support good DJs. <laughs> <laughs> Sing, 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 you know how I act now If you got a problem, come and see if I'm a back down Act wild, steady sipping drink This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com